And I'm so happy to welcome this morning our own Fred Hacker to lead us in the worship today. Welcome, Fred, and thank you. Thank you. Good morning. You have heard me say before that I believe that the Bible is true. All of the Bible is true. But I do not believe that all of the stories in the Bible are real. One of the stories that offers an example of true but not real is the story of Jonah. Many devout and respected theologians, Bible scholars, Christian leaders have concluded that the story of Jonah is valuable, but factually and historically not accurate. But that doesn't mean that this story is unimportant. In fact, this story should not be discounted. It has a significant position in three great world religions. In Judaism, the book of Jonah is read every year in the original Hebrew and in its entirety on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In Islam, in Islam, Jonah is the title of the 10th chapter of the Quran. And in Christianity, the story has been given significance by none other than Jesus himself. In Matthew 12, when Jesus is asked for a sign by some of the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, none will be given. He says, none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So there's obviously something going on here in the story of Jonah, something to which we should pay attention. So let's get into the story. It's found near the end of the Old Testament with the books of the other 11 minor prophets. And we're going to read the book of Jonah this morning. And we're gonna begin reading from the first chapter. And if you find the uh, screen a little difficult to read, I'll tell you now that it's found in the Pew Bibles at page 1436, if you'd prefer to follow along there. So we're reading from Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Sarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice and then we won't perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He, meaning Jonah, answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. 
Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. So, what's going on here? God has called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh, by the way, to understand the geography, Nineveh is part of the current city of Mosul in northern Iraq. So, it is important to know that this is a non-Jewish city to which Jonah has been sent by God. So, how does Jonah respond to God's call? He runs away and heads to Tarshish. Now again, to understand the geography, Tarshish is on the south coast of Spain near Gibraltar, about as far in the opposite direction as he could go from Nineveh. God is not putting up with that. So God sends a storm. Jonah knows that God has sent the storm, so he tells the sailors to throw him into the sea and the storm will end. Well, what do we learn from this first chapter? We certainly learn that you can't run away from God. Jonah found himself in the sea because he tried to hide from God. He tried to avoid the task that God had given him. He thought that by getting on a ship to go the other way, he could circumvent the job he was meant to do. The lesson here is that you can't hide from God. God is all-knowing all-seeing, and everywhere. At this point, what do we know about Jonah? He runs away from God, just like we sometimes do. But he seems honest, seems to accept responsibility. He admits the storm is his fault. He seems courageous. He invites the sailors to throw him overboard. Well, we'll see what Jonah is really like in a moment. After this song, we'll continue to read from the story of Jonah. But what happens to Jonah next? Well, we're going to find that out. We're reading from Jonah. We're going to read the last verse of chapter 1 and then chapter 2. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah... And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Well, have you changed your mind about Jonah? He prays to the God from whom he ran away. He acknowledges that God has saved him from drowning. He acknowledges that salvation comes from the Lord. And he ends up being vomited onto the land. What do you think? Will God give him a second chance? 
We'll continue with the story after this song. So we'll begin reading now from chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Well, now this story is getting interesting. God sends Jonah to Nineveh a second time, and Jonah agrees. Now, remember that God has asked Nineveh, God has asked Jonah to preach against Nineveh because of the wickedness of Nineveh. So God tells him 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And how did the Ninevites respond? Did they laugh at Jonah? Did they ignore him? Did they carry on in their wickedness? No, they believed God. They prayed to him. They fasted. They dressed in sackcloth, which is a way of showing penitence, and they hoped for God's compassion. And how did God respond? He had compassion and did not destroy them. So what do we learn from this? Well, I think there's a very important lesson here, and that is that God's love can change people. This is one of the main messages of the Christian faith. God's love can and change and does change people every day. This was the case for the Ninevites. This was the case for the sailors. And today, this is the case for people that choose to follow God's word. Well, we'll continue with the conclusion to this story after this song. Well, God has saved the Ninevites. How do you think Jonah will respond? We'll find out. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, referring to God relenting and not destroying the Ninevites. Jonah became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant?
plant. It is, said Jonah, and I'm so angry I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Whoa, did you see that coming? God shows compassion to Nineveh, and Jonah gets angry about it? Jonah reveals that he was afraid that God was going to be compassionate to the people of Nineveh, and that was why he ran away. The Ninevites were not Jewish. They were not, in Jonah's opinion, they were not God's people. Jonah didn't want to waste God's compassion on those Gentiles, those heathen, those sinners. And God responds, have you any right to be angry. God's point is illustrated by what happens next. Angry Jonah goes and sits outside the city, pouting, waiting to see if God will send calamity on the city. <clears throat> God provides a plant to grow over Jonah to shade him from the hot sun. Jonah was happy about that. And then God provided a worm that killed the plant. Jonah got so hot, he wanted to die, and Jonah became angry again. God then asked Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the plant dying? Notice that it's really the same question again. Do you have any right to be angry? And God teaches Jonah a lesson. In effect, God says, I made that plant I'll decide its fate. And God concludes saying, in effect, and surely I have the right to decide the fate of 120,000 people and animals that I made, regardless of what you think, Jonah. So now what do we think of Jonah? He certainly is no hero, is he? He's actually kind of one of us. Even when he gets it right, he gets it wrong. Let's look at the whole story now and see what we can, what we can learn from the story. Lesson number one, God achieves his purposes despite our ineptness. Jonah was used by God in spite of himself. Lesson number two, God shows unlimited love and compassion. God shows that to all the players in this story, to Jonah, to the Ninevites, even the sailors, and all worship God. Now compare God's compassion to Jonah's. Jonah had a real issue with compassion. He didn't want the Lord to just show compassion to those that, 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 that he wanted. He thought that God should show compassion only to his own people. The Ninevites fell short of Jonah's expectations, so in his mind they didn't deserve compassion. But God disagreed and showed us that everyone deserves compassion and that by following God's word, they and we can receive that compassion. Well, the third lesson's a little more challenging. We sometimes need to be swallowed by a whale. That is, we need to be taken into a dark place of listening and discernment. We need to let go of our ego. We need to let go of our own agenda. We need to take time to just listen to God. What we really need is to be knocked off course the way Jonah was. 
Jonah needed to be shoved out of the boat or he would never have reached Nineveh. Think about that. God had called him to go to Nineveh. God had to have him thrown out of the boat to secure that objective. Lesson number four. God's mercy is extended to all. Despite how God's followers might feel about this, Jonah's upset with God for offering mercy to the people of Nineveh, and God gets downright angry because Jonah has forgotten that the God he serves is a forgiving God, willing to extend his mercy to all. As Christians, and think about this, we should want God's mercy for others. Lesson number five, we are not God. Jonah gets angry when God didn't smite the Ninevites. Jonah gets angry when God takes away his shade. And God reminds him who created the plant and the Ninevites. What is anger, really? Think about babies. Why do they get angry? Because they don't get what they want. Why do we get angry? That's right, because we don't get what we want. God is God, and we're not. Lesson number six, and now we come to the heart of the story. We need to go down to come up. Jonah shows us that sometimes we need to change ourselves, not just change events. You've heard it said that people with addictions must hit rock bottom before they can heal. Well, people don't turn their lives around when things are going well. In fact, unless we go down, we'll never come up. And this is how we introduce the sign of Jonah. A few weeks ago, I was reading Richard Rohr's blog, and he referred to the sign of Jonah. And I confess to you, I knew I'd heard the expression, but I couldn't remember where or the context. So I'd ask myself, what is the sign? What does Jonah's journey illustrate? What does it foretell? Jonah is in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. He is, for all intents and purposes, dead. And then, he's alive. He is, if you will, resurrected. Jonah says, or Jesus says that the story of Jonah is the pattern of transformation that Jesus himself offers. It is the mystery of death and resurrection. New life only through death. You know, Christian theologians have traditionally interpreted Jonah as a type for Jesus. Jonah being swallowed by the giant fish was regarded as a foreshadowing of Jesus' crucifixion. Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, dark and alone. Jonah emerged from the fish after three days, and that was seen as a, as a sign or a symbol of Jesus emerging from the tomb after three days. That's the sign that Jesus offered to the scribes and Pharisees, the sign of death and resurrection. Here is the sign in the words of Jesus in chapter 12 of Matthew's Gospel. And this is Jesus speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees who said, give us a sign, sort of do a miracle for us to prove to us who you are. And Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights 
in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. So, that's the story of Jonah. A story that many agree is fiction, but it has many lessons for us. Maybe the primary lesson is this. The Bible is full of truths, even if the stories aren't real. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we come before you knowing that we are unworthy and undeserving of your love. But we acknowledge that you are, in the words of Jonah, a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. I pray that the story of Jonah will be remembered by us for the truths that it teaches. Today we pray for intercession by you on behalf of those who are suffering. Give peace and comfort and hope to those who are facing medical challenges. Be with those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Bless those who are suffering financially or emotionally or physically. Help those who are dealing with difficult relationships. Support those who feel unwanted, unneeded, or unloved. We pray for the leadership and the congregation of this church that we shall find a way forward if that's your will. Bless our pastor and his family, our session, our teachers, our praise team, those in our audiovisual team, those who support the soup kitchen, our small groups, those who lead and serve on committees and teams. We pray for the leaders of our communities, our province, and our nation. We pray your blessing on our newly coronated King Charles III and Queen Camilla, that they may serve with humility, with wisdom, with compassion, and with integrity. There are many areas of conflict in our world. Jesus, we know that you are the Prince of Peace. So we pray that you will bring peace in Ukraine, in the civil wars in Myanmar, Ethiopia, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, in the ethnic violence in South Sudan, in the drug wars in Colombia and Mexico, in the terrorist insurrections in Sudan, Algeria, Nigeria, Mali, Iraq, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Burkina Faso. We pray that each person here today will hear your call to service. We pray that we will not try to run away from you, but that we'll understand the mission you have for us as a church, as a community, and individually, and that we'll serve with humility and joy. Thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed on us. Please hear our prayers offered in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.